Thank you so much for joining me. This is Greg Soden. On this episode, my guest is Dr. Peter Stiepelman. Stiepelman is the author of the brand new book, An Imperfect Leader, Human-Centered Leadership in After Action from Roman and Littlefield. The book tells the story of a superintendent from his first days through the pandemic. In each chapter, he responds to a series of questions to prompt genuine reflection, and the book is structured to give leaders the tools to become predictably successful. Steepleman is also the 2021 Missouri Superintendent of the Year, and he lives and works now in the Pacific Northwest. He serves as an advisor to leaders and hosts a weekly podcast, An Imperfect Leader, the Superintendents and Leadership Podcast, where he talks to leaders across the nation. You can find the podcast and information about the book at the website www.petersteeplman.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Dr. Peter Steeplman, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much, Greg. Great to see you. I am delighted that we get to spend this time together and hang out. And before we get into sort of our backstory and our, you know, collaborations that we've had together over the years. I am wondering if you can just spend a moment and introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners out there so they know who you are and what you do. Well, my name is Peter Stiebelman. I was the superintendent of schools in Columbia, Missouri, a district that is rural, urban, and suburban. So a really interesting kind of place with many different perspectives. Um, 19,000 kids, 3,000 employees, so a large district, about the fourth largest in Missouri. And before that, I was a teacher in Missouri, as well as a teacher and an administrator in Oakland, California. Before that, I was an insurance agent, believe it or not. <laughs> before that, <laughs> before that, I was, um, I worked at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid, Spain. So I'd always thought I'd go into foreign service and found myself in the superintendency, which really does require a great deal of diplomacy. So uh, that's who I am. Currently, I am an author and a podcaster and an advisor and a uh, coach for leaders who are uh, in lots of fields and specifically in education. But I've been recently talking with individuals who are doing other things as well. So that's been kind of cool. Yeah, your your backstory I'm learning some things about you lately that I've never known before. Like I never knew that you worked in Madrid. I never knew that you were in insurance. I'm wondering what like some of your big takeaways from your pre-education career are like, what lessons did you carry over from that into your work in education? Sure. Well, at the embassy, you make decisions with those who are most impacted by decisions and you try to, as best as you can, get close to where decisions are being made. Um, and I think that when I was a superintendent, I had to remind myself from time to time that when you make decisions for, in central office without engaging those who are most impacted, that's typically when decisions go poorly. And so I'd say that the embassy probably taught me that. And then in insurance, was really understanding systems and what people are trying to cover and protect. And you're really thinking about the fact that lots of people don't want to talk about insurance, but it's really important. And so then when I became a superintendent, risk management became a big part of the job that I did and understanding the kinds of risks that might take place and the scenarios that you unfortunately have to consider because sometimes they actually come to fruition. And so mm. really being thoughtful about protecting the taxpayers' money, as well as protecting children and their safety, uh, became an important part of, of what I did. And I would probably draw back on my experiences in insurance for that. Amazing. That's really cool. Well, some the way that we know each other, we go back a long way at this point. So I'm delighted that we can have this conversation about your work, your new book, your years of the superintendency, because you were my superintendent for six years whenever I was a high school teacher in that exact same school district in Columbia, Missouri, with all those wonderful students and um, and educators and administrators that you were just referring to a minute ago. Um, so you were you were my boss, and I'm so grateful that we've actually been able to like maintain a, a relationship over the last couple of years. Um, what do you remember about my 
teaching. I'm super curious because, yeah, look, uh, he's, he, you, you know, obviously this is an audio uh, conversation, <laughs> but I can see you right now and he's blushing. Everybody's blushing. Yeah. He's turning red. He's getting nervous. Yeah, I, I would say, actually, there are a number of people that I've remained in contact, uh, mostly because they just are people that inspired me. And truly, Greg, you were one of those people who were among particularly the social studies teachers. Um, and this is kind of exciting, I think, because those who know you through Classical Ideas or your other podcasts and, and the other interviews that you do you know, may not know just sort of where you sort of you know, lined up in terms of these other individuals like, you know, George Frizzell or Matt yeah. Cohn, um, Jill Villasana at, at Battle High School. I mean, these are individuals that I just held and hold in such high regard. And you are among them um, because yeah. I really thought that like those others, that you understood the role of a teacher as an activator uh, yeah. as, of knowledge, right? You, you didn't proselytize, you didn't lecture, you really engaged kids to do their learning and to question, and you would take alternative sides as a way to just deepen their learning and make them just deeper learners and deeper leaders. And so I, I found that really compelling. Well, and then of course, I decided to leave the superintendency and pursue other interests. And it was through this sort of soul searching tour that I was taking that I found myself in Buffalo, New York. And yeah. you were so generous with your time, as I said, hey, how do you do podcasting? And what <laughs> yeah. kind of mic do I get? And how do you write scripts? And how do you invite people? And what are some expectations that I should have? And my takeaway was I, I should treat it almost like a like an open mic night originally, you know, just initially, you know, if yeah. three people, your mother and, you know, an ex-girlfriend show up, you know, kind of thing. That's that's sort of like what happens at a open mic night when you're, a, you know, you start a band or something, um, you know, three people show up and uh, and you are grateful for them. And that's how I've sort of treated it. Yeah. My uh, my biggest memory of you is one time I was doing a a really intense Socratic seminar in my religions class. Um, shout out to George Frizzell, the founder of that class, who I sort of took that class that he was doing and took it to a different high school. And then George was absolutely my, my one of my teaching mentors, along with Matt Cohn. Both those two, two educators profoundly shaped the direction of what I thought was possible in school. So I'm really glad that you referred to both of them directly. But you, I, I just sent an email to your assistant and I was like, oh, would Dr. Stiefelman like to come in and do a Socratic seminar with my students? And I, you actually said yes. And then you showed up and you were on time. You were engaged. You asked great questions. They were super engaged with you. And the conversation was so rich and rewarding. I was like, this is so fun. This is what is possible in schools whenever you actually invite people to come into your space. Like great conversations like that happen. It was one of my favorite days I ever had in that entire class. That is so meaningful to hear that feedback. You know, I left going, boy, I hope I met his expectations because I think our topic was about like Palestine and Israel and it was hard and relationships. And I mean, you're talking about serious issues. And not only were you asking them to think about what might be considered a world away from Columbia, Missouri, but then you were also asking them to consider. So what does that look like in our own community? Where yeah. might there be these types of tensions that have existed over time that are in some people's minds insurmountable? And yet we're not going to be comfortable with just leaving them as is. We're going to keep working towards that, you know, peace and reconciliation and those types of things. Your kids were incredibly engaged and it's a, a testament to who you are because you're asking them to really consider tough topics and they're teenagers. And so yeah. many of them were like, Ugh. but they weren't. They were so I know they weren't. They were amazing. It was great. It was great. Um, so you got into podcasting. So we're going to get into your book, An Imperfect Leader, Human Centered Leadership in After Action. And so before we get into the book, tell me a little bit about your journey in podcasting, how you're finding that podcast, which is named for the book, um, and how you're enjoying that process so far and what's that doing for your life. Right. Thank you. So and initially, my thought was, I will create a podcast that will be complementary to the book, although it would be talking to leaders in other fields. And as I continued to write the book, I thought to myself, there are so many more stories that could be told by superintendents and leaders around the country who have a, perhaps a desire to reflect back on a decision they made, but never really had the opportunity to really consider through a structured type of interview, 
what got overlooked and and what did they learn about relationships and what frustrated them and what could they have done differently? And then in the end, what was something that was good that came out of the experience because of this idea that through our experiences and often through our mistakes is truly where our greatest learning happens. And so my thought was, let me launch a podcast that asks superintendents and leaders all across the nation from different states, big, big states, small states, small districts, big districts, cities, rural. And, and what we learn is there are a lot of similarities in the way that we lead and what we've learned from our experiences. And so the podcast became a project that became this compelling purpose of what if I could influence leader longevity? What if I could in some ways share with those who are aspiring to be leaders, who are new leaders, and even those who are existing to say that you're not alone and that we've all sort of had these experiences. And I mean, the national average right now is about three years for a superintendent to, to stay in their job. Mm -hmm. That is a woefully low number. Yeah. Now, if you disaggregate that, if you're a woman or a person of color or a woman of color, that intersectionality really re is reduced in terms of it's about two years that they get to stay in their positions. Real meaningful change doesn't happen like instantly. It takes time to build those networks and those systems. And unfortunately, what happens is that those who are teaching and those who are leading in the principalship, they're, if they're perpetually having a new person take over, then they're perpetually having to start again with yeah. new programs and new initiatives. And sometimes those initiatives don't go away, the ones that were already there. And so they're just compounded and piled on. And I heard one teacher say, it's not a plate anymore that's full, it's a platter. I yeah. Said, oh, yeah, that's, that, that is well said. It's a Vegas buffet. Oh my gosh, that's even better. I love it. You, you, you got it. Like I was just in Atlantic City, New Jersey for a music festival recently, and I went into a casino and I saw a gigantic buffet. So that's what immediately comes to mind for me whenever you Metaphor. talk about that's compounding ideas. Vegas buffet. So, um, you know, with the podcast too, the amount of stories, the life stories of leaders, it's in every single field. It is infinite the amount of episodes that you could do on this topic where do you see this going because you could talk to leaders in every single professional field you could do this forever the amount of stories you could record right i have a a, a commitment to myself that at least for two years i would do school leaders district leaders and those who are education adjacent sure for example i spoke to dave mcleod who is the ceo of thought exchange which is an organization and, and an entity that really transform the way that leaders can harvest the collective wisdom of their communities to get better feedback as they make decisions. So better advice as they're making decisions, as opposed to holding a world cafe, getting feedback from your community members who potentially are the loudest or have organized to be present, and that your takeaway may not be reflective of how the community actually feels about a certain topic. And so it's an amazing tool, uses AI to, to sort of generate who are, to generate what people are thinking, as well as a way to see where there might be common ground between two distinct perspectives that people are bringing to a, a certain question is super cool. So mm. an example like that, I could see in year three beginning to expand to other industries to ask similar types of questions because what I've been learning from those who have been reaching out to me over email or, or direct messaging over LinkedIn is to say, yeah, I'm not in education. However, what you just described is exactly what's happening on my team. I inherited a new team. I'm trying to figure out how to navigate that, the different dynamics in terms of our team. We're smart, but we're not healthy. Those types mm. of things. So it's, it's really kind of an interesting journey that, that this has really produced. Yeah, the smart, not healthy description really resonates to me as well, especially like post COVID uh, moving back into like a form of normalcy that schools are a little more recognizable compared to what they were in 2020, 2021 is uh, is really interesting because you have all these like massive talents of educators, like, you know, coming into the classrooms, coming back and then recovering from these like periods of trauma. So the 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 smart but not healthy thing is something that really resonates with me in this like post pandemic era that we're it's a currently really good point it, it comes from patrick lencioni's book the advantage which can certainly serve as a blueprint for leaders as they're considering where to go as they are developing a healthy team 
one of the things that I noted, particularly when I was superintendent, was exactly that. I had a lot of smart people, and yet I don't know if we had that positive connectedness where you had psychological safety, you know, these sort of terms that really speak, are we kind to each other? Do we respect each other? Are we really listening to each other? And are we willing to admit when we make a mistake? Serving yeah. as that lead learner. And that sometimes yeah. is really hard. So the book is about being a lead learner, admitting when we make a mistake and what we learn from them. And same with the podcast is really about asking people to be vulnerable and to really push that as a leadership trait that we all should embrace. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about the connectedness aspect too, is like you and I had a personal connection early in my career as a teacher in the district, because I invited you purposefully to my class on purpose by design. It's what I wanted to happen. And so when most people have an administrator come into their classroom, it's kind of like a nerve wracking, terrifying experience. Cause you feel like you're about to be a, like a judged and assessed and analyzed. But for me, it was like, Oh my gosh, please come in. So I had a totally unique experience with you. Whenever I would hear people critique leadership, I was like, well, I don't have that, that critique because I went out of my way to make sure that you were knew what I was doing in my room. And so that's one of my biggest suggestions that I always had to people whenever they were like feeling, you know, uh, unsure about leadership. I'm like, well, just get to know them, like invite them yeah. in and they, they want to be involved. That's exactly right. I mean, leaders and those depending on where the employee falls in terms of the hierarchy often have a disconnect and through that disconnect narratives sort of emerge in terms of who they are and and ascribe sort of uh, intentions or or you know good or bad often not the most you know uh, charitable intentions and, and it goes both ways right yeah that and so i do think that there's a real value margaret wheatley writes about this as well in terms of getting as close to people as possible so that you really understand and lean into an understanding that can be developed based on just the fact. So you invited me into your classroom and that could be a scary event for some, but truly it turned out to be a really nice one because of the fact that both of our intentions were, we believe in children. We believe yeah. that children should get the very best education. And so let's be a part of that together. Yeah. Let's talk about the book, An Imperfect Leader, out from Roman and Littlefield. I know the book came together after your retirement from the superintendency. I'd love to know about a little bit about the decision to retire, what that journey was like for you, and then getting into the writing process for, for this book. I know that's a lot of questions in one, but take it as you will. I will. I wrote the book mostly because I wanted to have an impact on those who are entering into the superintendency. I wish that I had a book like this. I, actually, when I first became a principal, I read Daniel Balud's book, uh, Letters to a Young Chef. And I thought, wow, what a profound and perfect way for a new chef to think about everything, not just cooking, but also about the interpersonal piece of those in the kitchen, those who are in the front of the house, to consider those who are coming into a restaurant and how do you immediately create this cultural field that says to someone, you're about to spend a lot of money at my restaurant and I want you to feel like you are the most important person. And so I began to sort of apply that to schools. There's a cultural field. You know that when you enter a school, whether or not you feel welcomed immediately, are there pictures of children? Does it say, we're happy you're here? Or does it say, all visitors must sign in before they take another step? Yeah. And as you walk in and you look and you say, hi, I'm so, I'm here to you know be your volunteer reader today and they say sign in or they say you know mrs kapadopoulos where is the visitor passes right and you're just going i don't really feel very welcome here right yeah that's the cultural field and then as you walk down the hall do you see adults and children really engaging in thoughtful conversation with each other not profound but just do they feel do you get a sense that they feel valued and honored and so i decided i wanted to create a book or write a book that suggested to leaders a leadership model that I didn't have when I first became a superintendent. I had great mentors, but I didn't necessarily have a leadership model that I could lean on that would say things like, how do you create that collective aspiration that says, this is the heart of what we do and what are we going to create together and how are we going to be together? So how mm -hmm. are we going to be together speaks to these sort of nested patterns of sort of the values that you, that you live by empathy and compassion, curiosity, right? Those types of things. And then are we gonna build good systems? And we can talk about systems if, if you desire, but 
you know, how are you going to build good systems? Because it can't always be about relationships. When I was a principal, it was fine. I had 350 kids. Like I knew every kid by name. I knew their families. I could build meaningful and enduring relationship with those kids. But then when you become the superintendent of 19,000, yeah, you can't know everybody. And so how do you build reliable and enduring systems that really do project your values and at the same time have reliable sort of answers to the kinds of questions that people might bring forward to you. So I wrote the book as a way to sort of influence those aspiring and new leaders in any field, but particularly in education, to begin considering a leadership model as well as the power of systems. And then to use story, you know, woven through the entire book, because I think story is really important when you're when you're a leader. They, I, I think often we we forget how important the power of language is when mm. you're a leader. N- not many people care about you know just the numbers. They care about story and why they have to care. You, know, you got to speak to people's hearts. Yeah, you know, every time I ever saw you talk in person uh, in my in my job as a teacher. Every time I'd be like at a faculty event or a community event and you would talk, you would always pull out this little notebook and you would always give a a talk where you would tell stories from your own life. And you would often tell very personal stories about members of your own family, uh, eras of history within your family. Tell me a little bit more about why story matters so much to you as uh, as an educator, as a leader, as the author of this book. So... I do have a mentor and a coach. Her name is Linda Henke. She actually designed the leadership model that I use and and introduce really formally to the world in my book. And she really helped me sort of understand that nearly all leaders craft a narrative to help define their organizations and to define their values, to to define or to establish that compelling purpose. And she said, one of the most powerful tools of transformational leaders is language. Our use of language shapes to a large extent the way that people see us and how much they trust us and how willing they are to commit themselves to the work that we share. And she says story in particularly, in particular, that story triggers emotions and connections that are seldom accessed in other kinds of language. And so I always like to use metaphor or framing or scenario building and story. And it's true, I would use story of my own family, particularly when my children were young, because we all know that children really do provide some levity to our lives, <laughs> but then they also provide lessons for yeah. our lives as well. And so I used story as a way to introduce a theme before I got into, particularly if we we're talking about difficult concepts. And I would use my classroom as a, as a way to sort of talk about the lives of the kids in my classroom or my children or my family as a way to sort of also present and introduce myself because you're not going to care about what I'm talking about unless potentially you care about me. And I know that sounds sort of egotistical and sort of, I don't know how to even describe that other than to say that if you care about the person who's talking, you'll lean in and -hmm. listen a little bit more. And so it's almost like the, this American life type of thing. I want people to lean in to hear what I'm actually talking about. Yeah. Well, it works because I remember being in like faculty events or community events. And I, I can very, I have very vivid pictures in my mind of those you likely moments. likely remember the bar mitzvah story, which is hilarious <laughs> that in order to convince a community to raise their taxes considerably in mid Missouri, <laughs> yeah, that I was using the story of a bar mitzvah. <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh my gosh. That is absolutely hilarious. Um, you, you mentioned your classroom and you write very clearly about your experiences and what you call trailer C. And for anybody out there in a career path, they you remember some really important moments that crystallize the the trajectory of where your career goes. For me, it's teaching abroad my first couple of years instead of just like looking for an in-state job like a lot of my cohort members were doing. I taught in Mexico. I taught in the UK. I did a master's in Canada. So like for me, these are these really transformative and pivotal moments where my life took a particular turn instead of another. And so to me, it feels like one of your main moments is uh, your experiences in Trailer C. And I just want you to take a moment and reflect on what that mo- what what that meant to you and what that particular group meant. So similarly, I had incredible experiences working in Madrid, Spain, growing up in New York, which is really 
as many people like to say, is a real melting pot of our nation, although I've also read and agree that it's sometimes a bento box. There are really distinct neighborhoods that are very, very much separated from each other. And it wasn't until I got to Oakland, California and teaching in Trailer C, which I remember that first day, I remember going to the office and saying something like, hi, I'm your new third grade teacher. I'm just so excited to be here. And I remember the secretary with like, the sort of glasses down at the end of her nose said, you know, here are your keys. And I said, okay, but can you tell me where Trailer C is? And she said, it's between B and D. Like, yeah. oh God, who is this idiot they sent us, you know, in this revolving door of teachers in, in <laughs> Oakland. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll go find it. So then I like to sort of step back and say, oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, I grew up in New York, but I really grew up as an adult and became more familiar or it's almost embarrassingly really sort of woke up to this idea that um, there are such discrepancies in terms of and such a chasm between those who are middle class and those who are not or those who are wealthy and those who are not in terms of just this gap in experiences and opportunities and so i know that when you were a teacher you heard me on and on talking about aeo achievement enrichment and opportunity yeah it was in trailer c that it was born it was saying how do we make sure that kids have access to great teachers and great curriculum and great materials and how do they have access to enrichment because i was in a school with no music and no art and no pe and no science that was all the responsibility of the classroom teacher and so some knew how to do it and some pers didn't pursue it and then opportunity was, how do we rethink discipline? You know, when a kid curses you out in classroom, I'm not saying it's okay, but it's all right to say, mm, we don't do that here. Or how do we, like, let's just qu take a quick second to rethink how we're behaving in, in this room. And, and not to embarrass a child, but, you know, when you're talking to them on, on the side to say, um, I'd like to, I'd really like to reconsider how we, how we do this here. You know, that's just not going to work here. Um, as well as, opportunity for kids who might want to participate in music. So when I became superintendent, I found myself in this great position to be able to say, we're going to buy an instrument for any kid who wants to participate in music and in instrumental music. Instead of saying, why is it at that school with high percentage of children participating in the federal free lunch program? They're not taking orchestra. They're not taking band. So why don't we just cut it so we can save the money? Or why don't we buy instruments so that we can remove that barrier? Because for me as a superintendent, $80 a month to rent an instrument is fine for a family that is just trying to figure out how to make it to the end of the week at the end of the day, that's insurmountable. And in fact, their child won't even ask the parent because they go, why would I ask my mother who's already working two jobs with no benefits to invest in an instrument? My gosh, that sounds like a luxury we can't afford. Yeah. So trailer C, that's exactly what I, what I learned. I had kids who had come to the United States. Their parents had paid a coyote to smuggle them and their families uh, and they risked everything. So, I mean, for a better life, my grandparents did the same thing for us. So uh, I recognize the immigrant experience and how that has to have been the hardest decision to make, to try to risk everything, life and everything to get here. Um, and then for children who were born and, and spoke only Spanish growing up, whose parents put them in English only classes and then decided to move them over to a bilingual and then back and forth. and how it really produced an alingual kid. And that's really where my interest in systems became profound because it is our responsibility in education to help families make the very best decisions. And the system really made a, you know, the, a, a, a system, its structure will generate its behavior. And so mm. whatever it's producing is a result of the system that was created. And so, um, I became really in, invested and in, in involved in just wanting to do that. So Trailer C is a profound place, amazing kids. And I stay in touch with just a couple of them still. Nice. Uh, who, are, who are doing pretty marvelous things. Man, uh, one of my favorite parts of the book too is whenever you're on vacation with your own family and you retell the story of your own family's experiences and why you came to live, where you came to live. So it's like you're taking the story and the influence of the kids in Trailer C and you're ensuring that your own family knows those exact same stories for the version of your family as well. It's like a purposeful passing down. Yes, we're on the, we're on the, the mouth of the Black Sea my family got on boats in Odessa uh, in the Ukraine and, you know, risked everything to get out of a country that was hell bent on, on persecuting and, and murdering Jews. 
And so I'm standing on this bluff looking out on the Black Sea saying to my three small children at the time saying, you know, my grandfather risked everything and, and, he, and he came across right here at the mouth of the, of, of the, of the Black Sea entering the, the, the Bosphorus and, and, and getting to the United States and, and, and making a new life so that my father would have some opportunities and that, that my father could create some opportunities for us. And my gosh, can you believe it? A hundred years later, we're standing here seeing what he risked and the picture of them, which my publisher didn't allow me to put in there in the end because it costs a lot of money to put in photos, but they're just kind of like, just take the picture. Yeah, <laughs> so come on, Dad. At some point, they'll read it and say, oh, wow, that's pretty profound. <laughs> yeah, eventually, those are the kinds of moments that take a long time to percolate, and then you get to a certain point in your life, and it just kind of falls into place, and you're like, oh, my goodness, thank you. Like, I'm so grateful that I had that one particular moment because it takes a certain time and place and years of experience to cultivate the own earth of your own story of your life to kind of have those moments fall into place. So I believe that those moments will fall into place for sure. Um, I want to turn back to something you were talking about earlier with the work of, um, of Linda Henke and uh, the Santa Fe Center for Transformational School Leadership, where you were talking about the model that you describe and go into in depth in the book called the human centered school transformation model. And I'm wondering if you can talk to me, talk us through this as a leader talking to other leaders, but also as a as a leader who is talking to people on this podcast who may have, you know, no frame of reference really for what we're talking about. T take me through this model and why this matters so much to you. Absolutely. And during the podcast, I always have a section where I say in the leadership model that I use to advise others, and then mm. I will take one component of the model and compare it to or align it to the work that they're already doing in their district to say sort of like, why is this important to you? And so there are three dimensions to this model. And at the center is this culture of deep learning, you know, and, and one could say deep learning, deep leading. Truly, it's about, as I said before, one of the reasons why I hold you in such high regard is because you serve as an activator for children. You know, as a teacher, we, we serve as activators. But also it's about how do we approach things outside of a hierarchical model and more through a shared leadership model? Or how do we approach things from a human centered, which simply means that we're really focused on the people, right? Each one of us has our own hopes and dreams and we're all just so different. And we need to respect that and honor that as we lead a district or do our work together. And so there are three dimensions. There's collective aspiration, which is really the heart of everything that we do. There is nested patterns, which is the muscle of what we do, right? Sort of the reliable response to the different things that happen in our work. So high levels of collaboration and shared leadership. Those are two really important ones that you don't often see in an organization. We say, let's collaborate, but it doesn't always look like collaboration or we say, we believe in shared leadership, and yet when things get stressful, we fall back into these hierarchies of, I'm the boss, do what I just said. Yeah, shared leadership. Let me tell you what I want you to do and go share that with others. That's not shared leadership, right? It's about allowing the fact that you might be on the organizational chart above somebody. However, you're gonna allow people who have better ideas and better ways of thinking about things to prevail in the end, or for you to incorporate their good thinking to make better decisions. Creativity and courage and empathy and compassion, those are parts of a nested pattern. And then certainly Carol Dweck's work on a growth mindset to begin challenging those things that you believe to be indisputable, irrefutable, that it's okay to actually begin to rethink the way that you've thought about certain things. And certainly as organizations and, and institutions are thinking about diversity and, and inclusion, those are important pieces. I've been asked recently to give a talk to an, a, an actual you know, a corporation about allyship and what does that look like and what does that mean? And, and this is sort of cross-cultural because it's a multinational firm, how that might look in different countries, particularly as they interact with each other. So that's been kind of cool. So you've got collective aspiration, the heart of the work, you've got nested patterns, the muscle of the work, and then you have the leaders learning work. And that's really the mind of the work. And so you can enter these um, these pieces of the model in any certain way. I, I believe, though, you really can't go anywhere unless you've got that 
compelling purpose established that shared images of success exist. That's you know, collective aspiration. But in that le leaders learning work, you've got serving as that lead learner. So admitting that you've made a mistake and learning from that. Um, and the use of power, the use of language is, is really important. And then applying systems and design thinking. And I wish I had done a better job preparing for the superintendency and really understanding how to apply systems thinking when I first started, because I probably would have made even better decisions, or quite honestly, if I'm serving as a lead learner, wouldn't have made some profound mistakes. Gotcha. Well, that's amazing. Um, and, you know, with regards to leadership, there's a quote in the book that I really enjoy where you said, quote, I believe leaders will achieve better results when they've considered the systems they've inherited, the systems they've created, and the systems they are determined to change. Because it acknowledges that we get a lot of stuff put onto our plates from the very beginning that we had no say in originally. And it asks you to be visionary with regards to what you have been given. And that's not something that everybody can just nail. You know what I'm saying? No, totally. Think about the fact that many of us work in school districts that were created in the 19th century. And those systems, who created them? Who did they create them for? And how did they persist? And they still exist because of what was originally conceived for what they wanted for their communities. And so a leader who enters into a system has to think about what they've inherited, right? You can't enter a space and immediately change the cultural field, which may, you know, consist of a nested pattern that says, we are a hierarchy and you may not contact the superintendent without first going to your principal. In fact, don't ever contact the school board. And yet, if you begin to enter that space and say, my door is always open. Well, everyone will come to you because they now have a new way of, of exercising their agency and their, and, their, and their will. And that can also undermine a leader because then they've bypassed the people who supervise them to go right to the top. And yet now you're spending all your time trying to navigate and negotiate the issues that are happening within your organization. So you should have an open door policy, but you should also create a process that allows for um, that access. And so, you know, you have to think about the systems you've inherited and then the ones that you're sort of creating, right? So, you know, for example, you know, now you've gotten the job and you're, you're creating systems. Let's say you create, let's say you create a community advisory, for example. And as you give more voice to groups who have historically been overlooked, you must as a leader lean in and then consider the perspectives of those who haven't been given an opportunity to not only be in the room, but given the now the authority to influence policy. But if you are creating those systems, then you have to lift, you have to live in them and embrace them and, and not avoid them or ignore them when you start hearing things you don't want to hear. And yeah. then certainly when you start thinking about like the systems that you are determined to change, um, and, and the biggest is systems thinking. So you have to start thinking about what is this decision going to look like a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, when I want to take action and I do take action and then I'm not seeing the results immediately, how am I going to manage the tension between action and results? Because people will start saying, this isn't working. We need to change gears. We need to shift. And sometimes you do. You need to make a mid-course correction. And sometimes you just need to give time for people to learn what it is that you're trying to do. Um, so you need to think about the big picture. You need to think about those things called causal loops. I do this, then this happens. And when this happens, I do this. And sometimes we get stuck in these causal loops. An example would be, I remember when I first became superintendent, I saw a kid cuts class. So then what, what do we do? We suspend the kid. <laughs> so then the kid can't come to class. Mm. So then the kid comes back to class and is further behind. And so the kid cuts class because they don't want to feel that shame and they don't want to feel that that feeling of of that they that that is being presented to them as they continue to fail. And so what do we do? We suspend them from school again. I mean, these terrible causal loops that we've created because yeah. policy said, well, if you don't come to class, we'll suspend you. So we removed that as an example. But then also just like adopting new curriculum. What is a process you're going to use, a system that you're going to build so that it's more likely 
that things will go well. Teachers will feel prepared. Children will will thrive. Parents will understand the reason behind it. Um, and these things cost money, so taxpayers will fund it. Or we want to increase the number of teachers of color in our school district. Okay, what's the process we're going to use instead of just saying, well, when the University of Missouri graduates more undergraduates of color, then we'll hire them. Well, that's not happening. So how do you look inside your system and say, who are our bright kids? And how might we provide them with a full scholarship to go become teachers in our system? And how are we going to build that so that we're doing that together? Um, so those are the kinds of things you need to think about when you're building systems. But I didn't understand those habits of systems thinking. I didn't recognize immediately. I, intuitively, I think I knew that, you know, how do I resist the urge to come to a conclusion and make a decision? So if you want to avoid impulsiveness, if you want to avoid the need to make multiple mid-course corrections, really consider the system you're building and those unintended consequences and all those kinds of things. So the quote, while it's, I'm glad you caught, you saw it because it's kind of early in the book and it sort of speaks to trailer C to some regard about what I was starting to learn, but really became a profound learning when I became a leader. You know, something else that I'm I'm really curious about is as a person who has uh, been a teacher for a long time, but has never served in an administrative role, the path to the superintendency is something that m almost no teacher will ever travel. Do you know what I mean? That's just not something that most of uh, people who, who work in education will ever experience. I'm wondering if you can talk to me a little bit about your own path from like classroom teacher through the superintendency, because that's a journey that I know nothing about. That's interesting. You know, as you were asking the question, I was considering to myself just what is a superintendent? I get that question all the time. I remember early on, someone said to me, don't you get summers off? I go, summers off? I, I'm the CEO of a very large organization that has 3,000 employees. Do you think I sh I would love to take the summers off. Do you think I should? They're like, oh. So it kind of said to me, lots of people don't know what superintendents do. Right. So, so the, the path traveled, there is a sort of a traditional path that one takes in terms of they're a pretty good teacher and then somebody notices them or, or they apply to become an assistant principal or a coach or some type of, of role that takes them out of the classroom and they can have a different impact. And then they apply for a principalship and they do a pretty good job in that respect and they have the respect of their colleagues and they are elevated to a central office role. And then Sometimes they move to other districts and take on other roles as well. And sometimes they can move within their organization because they, they have a value of promoting from within. And so they become an assistant superintendent and then and a superintendent. And the superintendent role, which is kind of interesting to me because it really is sort of like a three-legged stool with, and, and really it's sort of CEO, right? So in, in my perspective, you know, being the, empl the employer of 3,000 employees um, and, and you know, you're managing a $300 million budget and you have to think about where you're allocating funds and how do you make sure that you're harvesting the wisdom of those within the organization and outside? How do you make sure that your board of directors or in our case, a board of education, that you're meeting their expectations because you're their only employee. So you've got the CEO role, then you've got really sort of the lead learner, which is what I think teachers expect from a superintendent, somebody who cares about curriculum and instruction, who cares about the the um, the experience of a student as they progress through and have a good sense of what they're hoping that children will learn so that they can be productive citizens outside of school and that they are leading a vision for that work, particularly around education. And then the third is, which is kind of interesting because it goes back to your question about storytelling. Mm. So I say we're the chief storyteller. Some might call it lobbyist. And I think this is a profound part that teachers don't see superintendents doing, and it's a really important part of their role, which is everything from protecting local control, because you've got uh, legislators who are interested in influencing what's happening in your school district. So how do you lead the district and the, and the Board of Education's priorities down in your capital and being a, a really vocal proponent and an advocate for public education. So you promote legislative changes too. So there was a, a time where a principal and I, we spent a number of years alongside other superintendents in the region, really asking for the legislators to consider allowing those who are professionals in other fields to be able to teach in our schools. Hmm. This was not 
to replace teachers. It was to enhance courses where we were short in terms of, for example, Spanish teachers. Across the nation, school districts are moving to just enrolling kids in Rosetta Stone as the language program because there aren't enough credentialed world language teachers. Well, you might have a professor at the local university or someone who has a career and is a is bilingual or trilingual or multilingual, whatever, and have the opportunity to maybe teach a higher level course in that language. But they are restricted by law because they don't have a certification or a credential to be a teacher. It's hard to be a teacher. So it's not just that you have the content knowledge that makes you a good teacher, and we would make sure that we provide support or put it in the legislation that requires that you have a teacher side by side. And so we were successful in Missouri to get the um, visiting scholar legislation that allows someone who was a professional in another field to teach for three years within a school district. And then the expectation of, if you like this, then go get a teaching credential. So mm -hmm. it was to introduce and to take care of the fact that we knew that there was an impending teacher shortage and things like that. So advocating against vouchers is a really important piece. They Legislators do trust their superintendents, particularly in rural districts. They'll say, I don't know what it is that I'm being presented to vote on. So they'll reach out to their superintendents. So superintendents need to know that lobbying piece of it or you know, convincing a community to raise their taxes because every state has, does their, their school funding in different ways. In yeah. Missouri, for instance, a big part of, of, the, of a school district's budget is local money. So in Columbia, Missouri, for example, is about 65%. So you get state monies, which is about 30%, and then the rest of it's federal. So, I mean, just a very small amount of a school district's funding is federal monies. Um, and so how do you convince a local community that the future of their community is tied inextricably to the success of children now? Mm, amazing. You know, uh, I'm wondering if there's anything that you have thought about that you reflect upon that you think the teachers miss most about what superintendents do? Like, what are some things you wish that we knew more that we don't, that, you know, that we overlook? I think a big piece that teachers may miss, and it's not because, I mean, they, they shouldn't be having to think about this, right? If a superintendent is doing his, her, or their job well, they are allowing teachers the freedom to do their jobs as opposed to have to negotiate and navigate all the politics. And so in a town where we knew each other, that is a town that's deeply split. It is split because it is very town and gown. So you have the university, the gown, mm -hmm. and most people at the university are not from that town. And they bring perspectives and priorities from all over and many coming from universities. So one might say more progressive, more liberal. And then you have the town, those who have been there and whose families go back to when the town was founded in the early 1800s. And so they have some perspectives that often are radically different from those who are at the university. And so a superintendent's job is to try to navigate and negotiate and try to find common ground all around the success of children. It's a ton of politics. Um, I think that's something that teachers may miss. I think in many towns, as well as university towns in particular, so we were part of a, a network that included Madison, Wisconsin, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Brookline, Massachusetts, us, Ann Arbor, Michigan, where there's a great deal of media attention as well, and media coverage, and you might be the only big entity in the region and so everything is documented and, and everything is chronicled and everything is reported. And sometimes those universities have students who are learning how to be journalists. So they're doing a wonderful job of learning and sometimes don't always get the narrative correct. Mm. And so then a new narrative is, is spun. And so the superintendent spends a good deal of time correcting the story or fixing what has been broken. If we've done something wrong that appropriately has been reported and that it's something that maybe teachers don't always see. There's a lot of work behind the scenes and a lot of work building relationships and sustaining them with your chamber for commerce, with your city and county elected officials, with your local officials representing you down in the capital. So those types of things that I wouldn't suggest that they know about, but potentially is something that's missed 
And so when you're not present in their classroom or talking about teaching and learning, which should be one of the three legs of that stool, uh, sometimes it, it becomes a shorter, uh, a shorter leg. I don't know, I don't know what the best metaphor for that is. <laughs> yeah. You know, you mentioned narrative just now, and you tell the story of an administrator who you mentioned may have been somewhat erased from the narrative of the school district. And I'm wondering about your inclusion of the story of Phyllis Chase in, in the book as well, because I thought that it was really interesting the way that you purposefully told a story that may be uh, somewhat overlooked or slightly forgotten within the town. It's so interesting you should ask that question. I made the intentional decision to use her real name because I think it is important, particularly if you're talking about someone that you believe may have been erased from a community's narrative, that to use a pseudonym would have further erased her mm. value as an educator and as a leader. Um, if you read the book, you'll note there is a chapter about a school district doing really important work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So potentially your listeners in Florida might have to just say that they're learning about something else. But um, one of the big questions that school leaders ask themselves is, how do I talk about this really important work? And so there's a chapter in the book around that there's really not a great and one way to do it, but you really have to feel out and do this work together. That's the most important piece is that if you're trying to lead this work as the only person and people will say, well, I'm right behind you, then you really have to look back and say, well, <laughs> how far behind me are you? Because I, I seem to be standing here alone. And so the question that you asked and, and the story that is told is about a leader in a district. She was the first African-American leader in the district as the superintendent. And it wasn't until after the superintendency for me that I gave a more thoughtful look back on what she meant for the district and how really she was erased. So she was, should be credited with so much. She should be credited with bringing the first um, sort of, it was a, an achievement gap task force is what it was, what it was called. And it was the first conversations we were having around why is it in a well-resourced school district in a university town that African-American kids are doing worse than African-American kids in Kansas City and in St. Louis, towns that are under-resourced? And so she asked that question and convened leaders and teachers together to begin tackling a very difficult conversation. She saw an elementary school that was about less than a mile from her office that was really struggling with low enrollment because families did everything they possibly could to leave that school if they lived in the neighborhood and and had the means to provide their own transportation and a school where kids were not getting the kinds of support that they needed and so she should be credited with all these kinds of really pushing us forward she was asking us in in all those years ago to really deconstruct standards to say what is it that we're actually asking kids to learn and why is it that at that school, they prioritize these things? And at this school, they prioritize different things. Meanwhile, kids were moving, 30% of the kids were moving. So one in every three kids was moving from one school to another within a school year. And so they could be missing entire units of study. They, and so we were prioritizing adult needs over kid needs, those types of things. She should be credited with pushing us forward to do mm. all those things. And instead, she was vilified by individuals in the community because they didn't fully understand what she was trying to do. And a part of that is because her relationship to education was really the internal system working within the school district, as opposed to really considering internal and external systems that exist. And it wasn't uh, a few months after a failed tax increase um, election that she was gone and mm. sort of set us back because we returned to and this is something that I say in the book, which is that whenever you agitate for change, the system will work aggressively to return to stasis. It likes status quo. Those who were doing well in the system would like to maintain that system. And so those who have not performed very well in that system don't necessarily have the voice or agency to change the system. And so here she was agitating for change and the system worked pretty aggressively 
to say, we want someone new. Interesting. Well, I mean, I'm just glad to know that story as well, because as a place, as a person who has spent a great deal of their life in that town, working in that school district, going to that university, seeing how that story kind of like weaves together is uh, is powerful for me in a way that might not be as powerful for listeners out there, but I bet you they could find an example in their own town. I would exactly agree. I would challenge anyone to look back at their own systems and think, or their own school districts and say, how has that happened here? Because there's a story in there about sort of the the elementary school that was after after Brown versus Board of Education, right? So we're talking about 1954, that the school district really resisted integrating its schools. And they finally said, fine, we'll take 11 African-American kids at this elementary school. And all of a sudden the parents threw a fit because they protested that at their chili supper, that the parents of these African-American kids might actually show up at their chili supper and, and how outrageous that would be. And they had an, a one-on-one -on -one or a, a, a group on one meeting with the superintendent to say, what are you going to do about this? I mean, what are you kidding me? So you talk about the, the systems we inherit. And so you, that's, you know, we're not even talking now the 18, you know, 1873 when the district was founded, which was likely founded by those who thought it would be okay to enslave humans because, you know, Missouri while a, a free, you know, uh, while a, 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 a slave state, right? So we're talking about, you know, Maine comes in free, Missouri comes in slave, you know, Missouri compromise. And there are those who say they established that school district. So think about the systems that were created when it first started. So any one of us could go to the state we're in and look at when their systems were created and how that, you know, sort of persisted and, mm. uh, and then what that meant for the first African-American superintendent who wanted Amazing. to agitate for change. Wow. Um, powerful. Um, well, I'm really loving this book. I'm so happy for you that you have, uh, you know, been so productive and, you know, moving forward in some, in some new creative endeavors, continuing to advocate for schools uh, to have excellent structures of, you know, for the faculty and the leadership to work together for the betterment of uh, all students in a district it's really cool to see what you've gone on to do after you have uh, left the superintendency and how you will continue to work for, for those systems to improve in the coming years because um, it matters a lot because you never know what kind of impact you're going to have from here on out working with other districts and other teachers and other leaders. So thank you for continuing to care about the topics um, that you've spent your entire life building. And I'm wondering if you can just spend a moment and tell people listening out there where they can find your work if they want to follow along and uh, and know more in the coming months and years. This has been such an honor, Greg. I am so grateful to you for this opportunity to talk with you, to talk about the book, talk about the podcast. A anyone can find me at petersteepleman.com. So Steepleman is S-T-I-E-P-L-E-M-A-N. So petersteepleman.com. You can follow me on LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, um, and, and certainly you can find my book at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere you find books and the podcast on any, anywhere where you download your podcast. You know, truly it's like when we create policy, we got to consider the unintended consequences of the systems we're creating. And so that's really a big part of what the book is about. It's a big part of what the podcast covers and regardless of the industry you're in and the areas of your interest, uh, you will find that the book and the podcast really speak to the work that you're doing, whoever you are listening today. So I really, again, thanks so much.